couple rides and walk back to my truck and actually grab my five weight and there was like a my split top of mergers which still tied on my rod from last november and i didn't even tie it, tie it. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> a little goo on the top and like to work no they were eating that day i mean nice. they're week before they were freaking ice shelves yeah. yeah i mean it's been a cold winter which was saying is a good thing i mean it hasn't melted the snow as quick i mean yeah it's my favorite time of year to fish the snake, honestly. It's like, the oh best God, time like, of year. Like <laughs> <Yeah>. April <laughs> and frickin' November, and, uh, and you just fish for like two or three hours and have the same fish you have in a whole day. Right by know. Astoria there? South of town's where it's at. I mean, I'll fish from like the Boy Scout camp down there. Years ago, we did a tracking study. Uh, we had transmitters and fish in the Hoback. And several, like three of them out of thirty, ended up like spending the winter right by Astoria Hot Springs. Like, oh, they always oh, do. Smart fish. I mean, yeah. Have you ever seen the? Uh, <laughs> Makes sense. John I, Keith, ever seen John Keith's thesis? That's actually I a book. One from I have the hot not. Springs. Yeah. I'll bring it to you. No, I was talking to me telling me about the stuff years ago. I mean, they're super migratory, but like, yeah, if there's like, I mean, the Hoback Ridge, the Tractor Run, just up from Astoria, all those places where there's runs and deep pools. Mm -hmm. There's the fish winter there yeah. yeah and you wonder how many are in there I mean, yeah are they just like shoulder to shoulder like stacked when down they're eating they you seem to be them. yeah yeah they're in like that white fish water you know like yeah oh yeah it's just sitting in there but no, it's, it can be That's good. And I said, I'm lazy. It's like, to go ski in the morning and wait till about 2 o'clock. You know, yeah. in in you get a little later. Yeah, there's no evening. reason to get up early, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I got there at 2.30. Uh, uh, I figured I'd wear it. Cause yeah. Oh, I've done that before, too. It's just got to. Yeah. So a lot of times you wait till it hits freezing and add two more hours. I mean, literally. Even when it hits freezing, it's above that. It's two more hours. Oh, it's, that's when the temperature goes up to 10, 15 degrees like in an hour. Yeah. Call it a speech Ready? pouch. Damn cold-blooded creatures. Speech pouch. <laughs> <laughs> you speech Are you done chit-chatting? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're live. Oh, we are. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> it's alive. It's alive. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another uh, week of Taiwan on Tuesday. We've got a full house today. Um, so we got a lot of fun stuff. Uh, Howard, we got Beverly and Leslie here from Trout Unlimited. Beverly works for National, and uh, Leslie here works for the Jackson Hole chapter. So they've got a lot of cool updates um, on projects and everything that are going on. Scott is tying up some salt water flies, um, a crab and a shrimp. So, you know, we have spring break on our mind, so very relevant. Oh, yeah. And then we got uh, Travis and Chaz over here from Jackson Hole Still Works. Made some delicious cocktails, and they'll tell us some fun stuff going on and their fishing adventures. Um, and I always, I have never introduced myself, um, in the past, like, two years we've done this. <laughs> my, yeah. my dad called me out on that. He was, he was like, you need to introduce yourself. So, I'm Claire. Um, I do Hi, all the Claire. marketing here at the store. Um, so, Chez, I might let you take it away. Actually, I've got a couple announcements. Um, our final fly tying classes start next week. So, we've got advance on Wednesday with Jay Buckner. Um, that'll be three-week class. And then Scott is doing another fly tying class on the 10th. That's just gonna be one night only. So give us a call if you guys wanna sign up for that. Um, and then this is our 50th year anniversary for the store here between wow. High Country Flies and Jack Dennis. So stay tuned for lots of fun announcements coming out throughout the rest of the year. But Ch Scott, um, I will let you say what flies we're doing and right. get, get it started. It's okay, I answered anything. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the handy dandy uh, Sanchez big redfish box, but work for other things here. So we do like uh, little crustaceans here, shrimps and crabs, love it. minus the uh, cocktail Some sauce and uh, sauce. green stuff. Yes. Oh. And these uh, work for a lot of different things. This is the shrimp, furled shrimp. So that's some 30-pound uh, mount ocean hanging out of the mouth. It's eye from a 20-pound black drum and like about six or seven 15-pound reds. So nice. it works. I think there's a crab in here that still has redfish goo on it because the squirrel tail is still stuck together. <laughs> but it's kind of fun, simple fly. Uh, it's going to go on the history of both these flies are going to be bendbacks. And bendbacks are a great design. Mix something weedless without a weed guard. So I'm going to grab a... Little book here, Sanchez Crab. Uh, Explain that bend back. Well, I'll do a bend back hook. 1987 TU Banquet was here, National TU Banquet. 
Maybe I left you create there and wanted me to do some flies in the book. But I'll show you the bend back hooks like, and I'll show you some of the original bend back flies. So. There are pre-made bend back hooks and then there are some you make your own. I tend to make my own because I got more options for hooks. And what we're trying to do is make a fly rod upside down and using the bend and the shank of the hook as a kill. And the cool thing about these flies, I mean, you can literally throw them up on the grass. This one's here is like a Umqua saltwater hook, 401, the old Dairiki 930s are the same thing. It's a stainless steel hook, so it's fairly easy to bend. So I'll do this and I'll kind of show it to you. That's about all you need. But that's going to use the bend of the hook, it's going to be part of the shank to actually kill the hook, and we're going to tie the body of the wing in here. That's a good solid hook. Uh, it's having a big, big Gamagatsu fan. And they're not very easy to bend, but nothing gets off these. The SL12S, mm -hmm. Poons, whatever, Reds. And it's probably not a bad thing to crimp the barb anyway, so I can release myself when I poke my finger here. So originally where the bend backs came from, they're probably reading history, 1880s, bass fishing with fly rods, you know, probably automatic reels, cane rods, and all that stuff. And they kind of, kind of evolved into salt water, and probably the guy that popularized the most is Chico Fernandez. And, uh, you know, some of his original patterns there, that same kill design. But it's a great design that you can modify to use for modern stuff. Uh, kind of where I first really started using them was living down in Texas, fishing for stripers and uh, white bass. And a lot of that stuff around Austin is limestone, which eats flies really badly. And not necessarily the hook point. It's kind of like cracks in the rock. They kind of wedge in. So this is my favorite flies in the universe. This is uh, Conehead the Barbarian. <laughs> 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 this thing is money. That's a little four-aught one. And actually, it's got a cone with uh, prism tape and epoxy around it. Mm. And eyes. you, know, you got to have eyes on it. You don't want a blind fish, you know? Like Eddie Murphy can train flies. My legs, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do this. And since we're doing crabs and shrimps, uh, everybody's always looking for eyes, right? Let's try to make eyes. I mean, this, these flies are like four or five-minute flies. I mean, they're really easy to tie. So you can buy certainly pre-made eyes. Monofilament burned and then they usually paint it in epoxy. You get it on multiple colors. You doing crab eyes? Oh, here we yeah. go. These guys? These are great crab eyes. You got oh, smaller yeah. ones there. Yeah. Nice. Dollar short. It's hard to find black ones. You just take them. That's awesome. Snip them off. Yeah. And one uh, little magic trick with tying in monofilament eyes: take a pair of pliers and mash it. Because mm. it's going to be slippery and it's going to be hard to tie in. Hairbrushes. But hairbrushes. Uh, your hair is getting little, long, Jazz, and we can kind of brush it uh, yeah. yeah. A little plastic Shedding bee well. chain, you know, from mm -hmm. the craft store or whatever, or you just jumped a little troll doll and clubbed it and took its necklace. You can <laughs> eat kind of apart, or... This Fat Tuesday, there's lots of options out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I'll just take a pair of pliers. It's an important fly time tool. During Mardi Gras is a good time to go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Reds, well, we use those. Everybody's up in the city. Yeah, <laughs> we get like those ones that do the like, Santa Claus flies with those pearl garland. Oh, yeah. But that's a simple little eye. It's a little more flexible, which is sometimes nice on smaller flies yeah. so you don't bounce the fly out of the fish's mouth. And then uh, if you want to burn them yourself, I mean, that's one that burned earlier. And it's going to come out the color of the monofilm, uh, but a great trick that uh, Jimmy Nax, probably one of the best saltwater ties I've known, did is if you color it with a Sharpie, 
it'll actually pick that color up. Hmm. That's pretty cool. And with different colors? You can use yeah, and some of it, mono burns blues. differently for different mono. This is like some hard mono, which is really good, only good for making eyes or making weed guards. Adjust it. And they're not going to be super big. So let's leave that there for a second. Let's give you another option here. Sanchez, be lazy. <laughs> if I need a bunch of eyes for somebody wants three dozen flies to go to the Bahamas, I could also just string up some beads. And you want to use, this might be a little heavy. Let's get a bigger bead, right? Yeah, I'll get a bigger bead. We won't worry about color right now. I just get some smaller mono. So Travis Chaz, what cocktail are we sipping on since we're in the uh, salt water? You know, I arrived uh, just in time. So yeah, this is all you, bud. So. <laughs> Chaz and I, Chaz especially, have spent a fair amount of time down in Louisiana uh, chasing reds. And um, we typically are down there in the winter, this time of year. And one of the greatest places that we stay is this wonderful place called Woodland Plantation. And there's grapefruits just prime. You just grab them off the tree. And so with that in mind, grapefruits being in season, we're drinking uh, our Stillworks vodka. This guy here uh, with our with our friends Fever Tree. I don't know if you've ever heard of Fever Tree, but they make uh, all kinds of great mixers. But they make a uh, pink grapefruit sparkling uh, kind of soda sort of thing. So we're doing just that and vodka, simple with a little lime in there. Let's see the new artwork. Oh yeah! Oh, yeah. do you want yeah. to talk about the artwork, bud? So this is a really cool artist, Bria Hammock. Um, every year we do an art competition and we change our labels. Um, and we get about 50 entries a year, and there's only one victor. But uh, Bria Hammock from Cheyenne won it this year with Bruno and Rose, which is a really cool, colorful uh, bison with a magpie, old Rose, sitting on his head. Um, and it's a pretty neat uh, process. We get the public involved, and everybody votes, and they pay a $5 fee to make a vote. And we raise a lot of money for the Wyoming arts throughout the state. So... Um, yeah, it's yeah, a pretty cool. fun, it's fun. fun project. So. Oh, yeah. 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 Pass it down. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Woodland is a cool place. Yeah. That like uh, old church at the bar. Yes. And the, uh, oh. Restaurant there is Absolutely. really cool. Spirits Hall. Spirits Hall, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And which, I kind of, which, which whiskey yeah. used the picture of one of the buildings? Oh, yes. Uh, Southern, Southern Comfort. Comfort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's like a bead strung on the mono. And what you do is you want to scour it with sandpaper to rough it up and you super glue a bunch of these in place. So like I'll tie a knot on one end and hook it between two fly tying devices and string up a whole bunch of bees, but it's a quick way to make a ton of them. Huh. Cool. Like right, Sanchez, be lazy. And then there's... Use chin whiskers for antenna. <laughs> Occasionally. Thomas Harms asked that. <laughs> yeah, I got a big cat that has whiskers about that long, Tom. So. Are we and talking then, about uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought we were talking about yourself. Yeah. 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 Just in time. I know, right? <laughs> and then the, and these are some pre made eyes I did that I kind of coated with some UV. But a really simple way, and this is something I learned from. Uh, yeah. yeah. From AK Best, we're roommates at some fly tying gig, is using rubber legs. This stuff here, they used to sell this jelly cord for fly tying, but it's basically used for, it's a stretch polyurethane thing cord for uh, stringing beads. But this, you just overhand knot. And I did a, a fly with tubing like that with larval legs. We call it the fat ass ant because it's oh. an ant, but everybody has a fat ass ant, right? <laughs> <laughs> you got that, but then, you know, better living through chemicals. I mean, they ain't gonna go very good. <laughs> we got more chemicals? Yeah, gotta have more chemicals. Gotta do some UV. <laughs> What you do I want? This will work. 
So those are all kinds of options. It's a lot quicker than uh, you know, I was being lazy at home doing my commercial tying. I just tie a bunch of knots and then UV them all at the same time. What's your UV stuff doing? Is it protecting it from the sun? Nah, it's <laughs> like basically epoxy that's set with UV. Just, uh, gotcha. SPF 100. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a pretty sweet looking little eye now. I got the black in the center. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do, but that's kind of quick ways to do it. Uh, I think I'll be lazy and use the bead eyes. And we can get into the furled shrimp. I'm going to do a big one, do a two hot. We'll go for some big reds. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's like a snare. No. Yeah. Because cool. we don't know Casper. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That thing. <laughs> that's that's exactly the. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking. I think this is the first time we've ever had ladies on Taiwan on Tuesday. No oh. way. Oh, right. So Cats thanks on. for joining. Yeah. Mm, wow. Even it out a little bit. Yeah. Bring in the nails. All stuff. right. <laughs> <laughs> so we got some. We got some eyeballs made. Let's do a hook. Uh, you can do this unweighted. We'll do it weighted. I think I'll throw a cone or uh, kind of some of these Groovalicious model tucks and tactical, tactical beads. Get it. Closed captions are having a very hard time with you, Scott. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me to slow down. <laughs> no, it's the words, not the speed. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's like when you do fly tying articles, you got to do your custom dictionary. They don't understand the word. I mean, the words aren't normal words, right? Yeah. 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 I've been working with somebody to do some translation of some fly tying stuff we do at TU into Spanish and realizing how challenging that is. Like uh -huh. the word grasshopper, there's like 20 some odd versions of the word in Spanish. And how do you relate that in like our We got a one size fit. It's really nuanced. Nice and, um, there's a lot of things in there yeah, <laughs> like, wow. that are unique, you realize, when you go through those processes. Oh, yeah. Switch over to Cone and see if this will go on. Otherwise, we'll do it without it. Language. Well, I'm sure you could come up with some very creative names. Scott does, you know. There you some go. pretty hilarious yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to put this in the vise upside down. If I was using my Dynaking straight vise, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, better living through chemicals. So with super glue, there's a couple ways to do it. I think you can squirt it out of the bottle and squirt it on everything. Or if you're using super glue, squirt it up. Because then it's not going to go mm -hmm. key bobbing out. This is uh, probably my favorite one. Actually, blood on the bottle, too. Puff <laughs> poke. <laughs> the Gorilla Glue brand because it's rubberized. And this is arrow fletching cement, which great works great. And they're like a little bit slower setting, so they don't kind of gum up and dry out and both these have needles that clean out the bottle so you're doing that from the bottom up so you don't have to buy it doesn't pants. squirt out all so over the place pair of pants or well i probably have to buy a new pair of pants either like put glue on or hot wax them with skis or you can use your toothpick and a disposable bodkin and just build up a little thread i'm using some uh 140 denier van danville three odd ish kind of stuff I'm going to build up a thread base just to hold the cone in place. Slip it out there. That's yeah, just about right. Do install hand, whip finish, or half hitch. Ain't going to matter. And then glue the cone on. And the thread gives it a little more to grip to. Yeah, otherwise it's going to spin around, which on this fly probably wouldn't matter that much. It's not really doing anything. Not like Cone had the barbarian, we turned him to a mullet to a flounder, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we like there's like I mean, it's funny when you hook a mullet or you hook a mullet, not a mullet, but a a flounder or a stingray. You know it's one of those two things right off the bat. It's like mm -hmm. this is going like this. This could be really delicious, or this could be really really bad. Yeah. <laughs> 
You always find leaders are cheaper than getting stung by stingrays. Yeah. They've got like three legitimate in the mouth. Wow. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, you don't really want to get stung by them. I got stung by one down in uh, Central America one time. It's not great. No, it's, it's, like, great. it's, it's like they dissolve <laughs> no. the flesh. Yeah. It's, so what does it do? It's giving you this when, you ha when you're feeling it? Does well, it like a regular fish, you have vibrations this yeah. way, right? But a stingray's going up and down. A stingray okay. or, a, or a flounder okay. is going oh, like this sense. way. Oh, yeah. right, right. So you know it's one of the two things. A lot of times, I mean, a lot of times redfish like Texas coast, if you're seeing stingrays you're gonna find fish yeah, yeah. they're both they're there for the food yeah. you know all right so we're gonna use some polar chanel we can use some uh, crystal chanel we can use some eyelash chanel <laughs> they sell that in craft stores literally like got some big eyelashes <laughs> <laughs> should we do a tan brown one what color we want to do So essentially, we got plastic hackle, right? Let's have some groovy colors. I mean, we gotta mix it up, you know. Do a little bit of root beer, a little brown. Shrimp come in a lot of colors. No ones that come in pink or dead. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna need to manipulate this stuff a little bit. Uh, let me tie this in and I'll show you what to do. So it's not like a little thread core. So when they put it in the package, they didn't straighten it out, right? So what we're going to want to do, I mean, a good thing if you're doing with a bunch of this stuff, just kind of stretch it out a little bit. But then if you're at home and you're going to tie a bunch of flies to this stuff, clip it to like a shelf or something and put a weight on the bottom and just let it you know untangle itself but to straighten it out you gotta get it tied in tighter we're going to use friction to get it straightened out and it's just like folding a hack like and actually the mylar is going to take a set right mm -hmm. We got it kind of straight now. It should look like my hair. <laughs> <laughs> These are fairly big ones. I think we need a couple strands of that. You kind of straighten it out, but regardless of the hackle you're wrapping, you definitely need to fold it and straighten it. Otherwise, you're going to have issues. Here again, straighten it out. It's like your cat. Oh God, that feels so good. Drop my back again. Oh, look at him meow. <laughs> Scratch it. <laughs> Do you have a cat, Scott? Yeah, Nadine. Oh. She's got whiskers like that long. She looks like a Sylvester. She still has all of them. That was, that was my cat. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think I'm gonna use Nadine three three man. strands. <laughs> Yeah, my son got it when he was working at Animal Adoption Center. Oh, that's awesome. And she likes more attention than the dog does. So that a little mix more color. And if this was a smaller one, I might just use some of the smaller polar flash and say like Crystal Chanel. You know, if they're doing more of a bonefish size one. Josh Gallivan is watching Cheswick. All right. <laughs> Papa Gallivan. You in Tahiti? He said he's cracking a cold beer. All right. <laughs> Better than a warm one. And I can actually kind of do the group comb here. Just kind of get stuff roughly lined up. I mean, it actually works pretty well. I mean, because most people really have trouble with this stuff. And then I'm going to twist this stuff up. And you can't comb my hair, but you can comb Chanel. I mean, these combs and these brushes are like the way to go for a lot of materials. And I've kind of played around some different shrimp, and it's like, I just love bandbacks because they don't hang up. Literally, I'm throwing these 
on the grass on the bank when they're on the shore mm -hmm. and you got to pop it out and then we need to grab with something so there actually is a purpose for a dubbing tool not dubbing so i got twist it up you ever build a rope build a bowstring mm -hmm. you twist one way and it folds back on itself right I'm just going to do that. Oops, the vice is moving. Do that. It's not like you need to give it a little bit of extra love there to hold it together. Here again, just twist, twist, twist. And you can use whatever. I mean, like, you could do it with, if you don't have a dubbing tool, uh, most time at home, I'd actually use my uh, wood finisher. Tighten the vise. You just need something to grab it with, and maybe twice the length of the hook. Pull it down and twist up on itself. And this is kind of an impressionistic fly. People really forget a lot of times. It's more important to have a fly act like what you're imitating and have it look exactly like you're imitating mm -hmm. i mean if they ain't alive they ain't gonna eat it now we can do some more combing let's get a good brush so you're getting good movement with that so oh yeah this stuff moves really well and there's some little leech patterns that are kind of tied like with extensions like that yeah i mean that furled body is cool i mean it's while he's brushing out his shrimp. <laughs> uh, Beverly and Leslie, you guys want to give us a little everyone. update yeah. on TU? What are some fun projects and um, stuff going on? Yeah, sure, I'll go first. So um, I'm Leslie Steen with Trout Unlimited and um, I work in the Upper Snake here based in Jackson. So I cover the Snake River headwaters um, in this area in Wyoming. Um, from Jackson Lake to Palisades and all the tributaries as well as the salt. And the projects I work on tend to, work, tend to fall into two categories. So I work on stream reconnection projects and restoration projects. So reconnection projects have to do with fish movement. Right before we started um, the live stream, we were talking about how much um, fish in this system move, how like some of the fish we've tagged before with game and fish in the hoback can swim all the way out and hang out by the one of the hot springs in town, Astoria Hot Springs. And so, you know, this is an important priority area for Trout Unlimited because of the native cutthroat trout population here. It's very unique to have native cutthroat trout be the main dominant fish in a big river system like the snake in this in this neck of the woods. So um, that's really our conservation focus. And so Stream reconnection projects are all about removing any kind of barriers to fish that are trying to migrate um, for spawning or for rearing or for winter habitat. And so that looks like getting, taking down dams, whether they're big, very obvious dams or small, smaller dams that are used for irrigation. And then um, also looking at things like undersized culverts that could block migration or um, in also in certain cases, fish that get stuck going down irrigation ditches. So a lot of the projects that we're working on address that. And then habitat restoration projects are kind of the other piece of that where we're actually trying to turn around habitat that's been degraded and make sure that it's there um, because certain types of habitat, particularly spawning and habitat for juvenile trout are really important for sustaining the local trout populations in the long term. So that's really what we, we focus on. And I think one of the bigger projects that we've been working on that's very, very close to being finished is up on Spread Creek. Spread Creek's a tributary of the snake that drains a lot of Bridger Teton National Forest lands and Grand Teton National Park lands. And um, in 2010, there was a big, like very obvious concrete dam that blocked the entire creek that um, TU and the park and, and Forest Service Game and Fish and a number of other partners all teamed up to take down. And what happened after that was we found that um, through some tracking of fish as well as kind of going in and doing fish rescues in the ditch at the end of the year was that um, 
fish were migrate, able to migrate freely in, in Spread Creek, but when they turned around to go back down to the snake, they would get stuck in the irrigation ditch. So the project we've been working on there um, is, has been to put in a fish screen. A fish screen basically um, lets the water go to the water users, but then the fish go back into the creek. And we've also been, you know, upgrading, um, doing some restoration and stabilization work right in the area, right around there. So that one's one I've been, I've actually been working on for years, it, like since I started with TU. So it feels, I'm really excited that that, that one's getting done. And there's, you know, years in the making. yeah, 11 yeah. years in the 12, making. 12 and, and yeah, oh, and it's wow. like over a million yeah, dollars of grants and, and, wow. and uh, donations and um, over 20 partners. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can report back when the fish screens in the spring. So, so. close. Yeah. So close. So well, close. And Leslie, one of the kind of unusual thing, um, I would say, and you can help me out, here uh, in the lower 48, what's unique to the Jackson area is that we have relatively an intake, not only have wild fish, but an intact native fish fishery. Yep. Which in most places, I mean, our fish is Snake River Fine Spot Cutthroat. Right. We don't have brown trout. We don't have rainbow trout. That's have. exactly right. I think, you know, you, you go to, we have Jackson's and, you know, the snake and Jackson's an amazing fishery. So are so many, so many other rivers that are just a couple hours away. But all those other streams, all those other rivers, the Green River, the South Fork, you know, the Madison, they're all, you know, they're all primarily in the main stem rivers. It's all like a brown trout, rainbow trout fishery. So to have native snake river cutthroat trout, you know, when you go out, fish the snake nine times out of the 10, you'll catch a cut, cutty. That's, that is unique to, to us in the lower 48. There are not very many systems like that left. So we're very lucky and it's worth, for, for us, that's why we're, we're doubled down and invested in doing work here. Yeah, that's right. And that's why Trout Unlimited is so lucky to have Leslie. Oh. Um, no, I mean it. Under your leadership, we've really been able to amplify the work here in this valley. Um, sure. But also really important to note is that we've had a local TU chapter here for many decades that Howard, you're on the, on the board of. Thank you so much. Um, and there's been a really important presence, too. And, you know, what you said is so true. Like, this is such a unique asset, um, having this native trout fishery here. But Unfortunately, that's not the case everywhere. In my job at TU, I work at the National Organization. They're just nice enough to let me live here. Um, don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't the secret get out. Um, and so my responsibility is to think a little bit more broadly um, than just the Jackson area. And, and the real honest raw truth is that despite Child Unlimited's significant impact and our growth over my tenure there, which has been 15 years, we're not keeping pace um, with the threats to trout and salmon. Climate change poses a real threat to trout and salmon. The pace of uh, development, industrialization, the list goes on, right? Like, uh, it's not a really pretty situation, and we must amplify our the work that we're doing, like what Leslie's doing here at the local level to restore and to care for our local rivers and streams. And we have a huge opportunity, which is a really great and fun time to be a part of TU and engage with TU through this infrastructure bill, which is gonna pour a lot of funding and resource and support through our partner organizations like the Forest Service, who Leslie works with regularly, mm -hmm. Bureau of Rec, um, the list goes on. Um, and TU's uh, hoping to partner with a lot of these agencies to help restore and uh, care for our rivers and streams. But the work that I do is to say that, look, look at the landscape. We're going to be able to amplify our efforts. We must meet this challenge. It's our mission. It's why we do this work, right? But it's all for naught if the people don't care. Like, it's all for naught, right? Like, what happens in the next generation if, you know, like our kids' generation, Chaz, they don't show up, if they're not advocates for the trout and salmon that can't speak for themselves, if a generation that doesn't have access because of systemic equities, inequities, I should say, because of apathy, because of, um, there's a lot of reasons that people today are not engaging in the way that we do as anglers to know that cold, clean water is so important. So. Um, I have the great job of being able to work with the 420 chapters across the country, um, and we work with our youth education team to really sort of engage kids from kindergarten all the way through college in our work, um, communities of 
uh, veterans and first responders and we're also working to sort of meet people where they are in new ways we've got really fun groups that are emerging that are women specific um, and that are sort of popping up around the country and so a fun time to be a part of TU we've doubling down on trying to make sure that we're reaching diverse communities and many more people um, as we think about the important work that Leslie's doing here locally and really across the country I saw a great bumper sticker today, by the way. It was kind of on that same note. It said, um, extinction is forever, dams are not. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty good. I had never it. seen that one. I saw it at the Albertsons light on my way home. Take out the lower four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Oh, man. yeah. Do it. Let them run. Yeah. I mean, I think I, that's one of the things that really, out of the years that, uh, you know, Scott's been fishing, I've been fishing, you guys have been fishing, um, you guys have been fishing is now uh, just what Leslie what you said we're finding the fish are migrating 40 miles 50 miles just in this system mm -hmm. so these technologies or I shouldn't say technology these facts uh, that we're finding and stuff now we can actually take and do some application to really enhance you know what's going on uh, coming up where before we maybe knew a few things and we knew things word of mouth whatever but now I mean, we're talking about science well yeah. totally you know it's interesting you mentioned that because it I think it's a real new frontier for engagement and that's what I was talking about before the if the people don't care it's all for not it's about engaging our communities whole communities and one really cool way is through community science or citizen science right where people can go out and use the smartphone that's in all of our pockets and be a part of the solution. And Leslie led this really cool initiative last late summer, fall, as the drawdowns were um, occurring that engaged a real swath of the community and sort of paying attention and standing up and saying we can do something about it. And tell people about that? Sure, yeah. Do you, you want to do that now or in a little bit? Yeah, we can. Let's see uh, what the next step is, real quick. See if he finished brushing his hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's well almost as straight as my hair now, <laughs> but it's got that. It's got a shrimpish profile, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a bend back. We're gonna fish it like a rubber worm. So let's impale it. So it fits in there kind of snugly. God, I just got my back done. <laughs> and we got so Scott, what you did there was because that was, you know, furled together. Yeah. You separated it and put it in between the hook. The we were running the hook point up through base that rope you created, right? Which is going to help keep it there. Yep. In that position, and then we're going to add some what will become antenna carapace. Some silicone rubber legs, these silicone ones will kind of look cool and they actually seem to hold up better than other ones. And I says this is impressionistic, but when you get these pieces parts together, you have a lot of those. One of the nice things about <clears throat> flies that are built this way is that their bodies are very soft, they fly very straight, they don't helicopter out on you, um, twist up your yeah. leaders as well. It's really nice so I mean we can modify the length but now you got kind of a carapace type look to it and then we could do boring black eyes but you know that's not really cool I think we need some beady orange eyes mm -hmm. you want really Mardi Gras this year. he's on bourbon <laughs> I mean, he's on bourbon street like you know went up north and like he's kind of lit up he has some <laughs> little bloodshot yeah. <laughs> uh, these got a little curve to it no, a couple of things with mono <laughs> Sometimes try to stretch it just like you do with a leader. Uh, another trick if you're dealing with mono to deal with a you know bunch of applications and it's like that heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lefty Cray trick. I mean, the man was a genius. Is uh, boil it like spaghetti and then pull it straight. Huh. Just mm -hmm. cut clumps of it, like you're trying to put tarpon leaders together. And I could have mashed it down. A little bit to get it easier to tie in. This stuff's not very heavy. The other thing you do is, like I said, that sandpaper trick, which I do for gluing, will actually give it a little more texture. And then a little glue doesn't hurt anything either. It's not really monster, you know, it's messing around with texture. 
Oh man. <laughs> well, was it the the model or the plastic bag? <laughs> <laughs> Never got into the bag. <laughs> and if we wanted to get like uh, real fancy here, I could go and put some dubbing or make another wrap of that crystal Chanel there. I mean, this is uncultured. Living in Nutria land uh, down south, he doesn't really care. <laughs> and a little, little, little goo here. <clears throat> so there's your your frilled shrimp, but just kind of a cool pattern. I mean, it fishes really well. It's going to be mobile. I mean, this stuff will just lay back, and it moves like a shrimp in the water. But a lot of applications for that. Let's shrink it down to a size 6 for bone fish. Just use finer material. If you wanted to make a dubbing loop, which I try not to encourage, you could do that. But, I mean, when you get it all together, that's a shrimp. Mm -hmm. I mean, for sure. That got the cocktail sauce or horseradish, you know, <laughs> a little butter. Mm. <laughs> Tasty. Feed me, Seymour. <laughs> so you can go fish for redfish for spring break, Scott? No, nah, I'm going to Hawaii. Oh, poor guy. You're so, going to Hawaii? I didn't even know that. Yeah. I mean, I don't catch fish. I mean, shoreline fishing at Hawaii is pretty brutal. And I just, I just, something about, I can't just go out and troll and sniff diesel, man. And it just ain't right. Yeah. <laughs> I got to hook my own fish. Yeah. But like stuff like that. And what's crazy with like the big island Hawaii and a lot of places is if you go in there, type a bunch of black flies because all the shoreline stuff is black. Uh, all the bait fish, all the crabs, yeah. they're the color of the bottom, right? Yeah. Where's the furled shrimp? We need to come up. Who has a better name for the furled shrimp? Should we have a contest to name the furled shrimp? Yes. Yes, so, yes definitely. All right. Yeah. Fat Tuesday theme. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be. Party gras. There it is. <laughs> so there's that. You, there. you just won your own contest. This time. Yeah, I know. All right. <laughs> uh, so I interrupted you. What were we? Oh, we, the project? we were talking about citizen science. So. Last fall, you know, was fall's kind of a busy time because that's usually when we do a lot of our project work. Um, and then there's a lot of opportunities for volunteer engagement as well um, because we do a number of fish rescues where we go into irrigation ditches at the end of the season. And a lot of folks help out um, with basically, sh we electrofish the fish out of the ditches, put them in buckets, and then return them to the nearest stream. So that's like, a lot of what we have going on and actual project construction work. But last fall was especially busy. Um, you know, I think we tallied it up actually after the fact, which is awesome. You know, I think over a thousand volunteer hours equaling over like 30,000 of people, $30,000 worth of people's time and energy and efforts to kind of give back to the local fishery. So that's awesome. Um, and one, I think one of the ones that, you know, we're, proud of just having been able to be a part of um, is um, mm -hmm. documenting the impacts of the drawdown of Jackson Lake um, in late September, October. So last year, um, flows are pretty high to meet irrigation demand during the, during the summer and even into the fall. And um, a number of us that work for different nonprofits and agencies, um, you know, found out that the schedule for drawing the water down from was going to go from 3,000 CFS to 280 CFS in about three and a half or four days, I want to say. And, and then um, Game and Fish and uh, the park were able to um, talk that, kind of negotiate a little bit and, and spread it out a little bit longer over five and a half days. And of course, the concern was you know, if we drop the water pretty much out of the system very quickly, does that mean that they're going to be more fish stranded, essentially, in um, as as side channels and pools and things like that dry up? And so, um, you know, there is just a big collective effort. Um, Jean Brune, local guide and um, fishing legend, um, yes, uh, <laughs> helped organize, you know, a lot of folks to, to basically do a citizen science effort. Um, there were two parts of it. One was measuring, um, putting out 
stakes, uh, measuring stakes um, from two, in two river stretches. One was Pacific to Dead Man, the other one was from Moose to Wilson um, in different locations. And then having people basically go float the river again every day or as close to as possible every day during the drawdown and take photos and kind of visually document what was happening in the river and how quickly the water levels dropped out and how quickly things dried out. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of folks are, came from the guiding community. You know, Howard was one of the people that went on one of those floats to document. And then another piece of that was um, as people were floating and then also we put out the call to the community at large um, was to essentially geolocate or tag places where they saw stranded fish or where they saw areas where fish were likely to be stranded. And then that information was used. We, we There was actually a TU app called Rivers where we, we plugged a lot of that information in and then went back and um, Game and Fish was able to lead a number of fish rescues um, to kind of not only to rescue the fish, but also to count, to get a, to basically get some data on what the impacts might be. So that was, it was, it was, um, you know, people were concerned, people are concerned about impacts to the river, um, especially folks that care a lot or anglers or folks that make their livelihoods. And, and I think um, it was pretty neat to see that those same people actually turn up and show up and, and help out. So, Sweet. yeah. <laughs> Did I just read that there's a public comment period or something yeah. like that for, for that right now? Yeah, so there there is a public meeting. Um, basically, you know, a lot of the, the water, the, the drawdown and the, the Jackson Lake Dam and the rate at which it's drawn down and everything is managed by the Bureau of Reclamation. You know, as folks probably know, you know, 96% of our water here is, is uh, the water rights are held by Idaho farmers. And, um, and then there are a number of, managing agencies like Grand Teton National Park and the Forest Service and the Game and Fish that all, you know, meet regularly with the Bureau to kind of try to discuss and communicate about some of these things. And so, you know, we had suggested because there was so much concern and, and I think, you know, wanting people to better understand like what happened in 2021, how bad was it, do we know, do we even know? and kind of what could be potentially done differently, what are some of those agencies trying to do proactively for, for next year, especially like it's feeling pretty scary right now with water levels. And so um, we decided to host a public meeting and basically that public meeting is, it's next Tuesday from three to 5 p.m. Um, at the 49er and there's also a virtual option. So there's a Zoom link where if you're not here or you can't make it, um, uh, you can zoom in and basically there will be presentations um, by a number of folks and then after that a Q&A so people can from the community can ask questions about Very cool. yeah so have a little bit more of a discussion and yeah I think I think the important thing to keep in mind is you know there's certain things that that where there there's certain things that are fixed and that you know can't change like water rights and then there are then there's certain things that potentially there there might be some more flexibility to change how how things are done and so i think that's going to be the sweet spot and that's what we're trying to do so mm -hmm. yeah. cool. that's good stuff yeah all right Chaz, what do we have up next gonna have a feather crab here uh you guys want some more sanchez humor yeah. Yes. <laughs> is there ever enough? <laughs> it's the Rocky Horror Tying Show. <laughs> we'll do the fly or It's just a twist to the left and a uh, twist to the right. Yeah. Put your hands on your vise. It's really out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> do the scissor thrust like you're going insane. Let's do the fly warp again. <laughs> Were we supposed to sing along? Oh, is, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that an original for tonight, or have you oh, yeah. this before? Oh wow! No, I mean wow. it's kind of special. I mean, T, you guys are coming here. <laughs> you're feeding us hooch. You're giving yeah. us good information about fish. You know, I mean, wow. One of the, when the <laughs> biggest things that's so funny with fly fishing and fly tying. You guys are around the business too. Is like, if fly fishing and fly tying are so much fun, why can't any of you people smile? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm like, oh my God. He's like, you're uptight. Like, I mean, like, you can't even smile when you're, when you're choking a fish. Come on, get with it. Yeah. <laughs> so we could have, like, built up some thread there with the twist to the left and the twist to the right. What's for dinner? Crab loaf. <laughs> 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 and this is a. Uh, kind of an adaptation of evolution, which a lot of the fly tying, I mean, I'd say evolution is, is revolution. I mean, there's not a whole lot of new things, you know, out there. Uh, let me do some, show you some pics here. So, the original fit, oh, that can lie on the ground. It's not gonna hurt anybody. It doesn't buy it, not think of. Is this fly here, this Lou Jewett crab, which I think was originally in the Chesapeake Bay for uh, stripers. And it's made of pheasant feathers, which makes a perfect imitation of a blue crab. Mm -hmm. And then Jimmy Nix, who was just the technician, came up with this version of it, mm -hmm. which is fairly complicated. But then Sanchez be lazy and he likes his bend back. So here's a simple way to do it. And you're always like tweaking flies, adapting them. Uh, to make a platform for the feathers to help them hold them in place, I'm going to use a little piece of foam. I don't need a little big, big chunk. And I kind of got the weight of the hook acting as a ballast is going to also help right the hook. And the other thing is when we tie flies, it's important whether we're tying this or we're tying a little bead head, don't block the gap of the hook. If you're going to tie a fly and want to hook fish, make sure, I mean, gap may be one of the biggest important things for hooking fish. Mm -hmm. Whether it's small dry flies, make the biggest gap you can, or if you've got a big old red fish, you've got to get around the mandible. We've got a poon. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, got a fish size twos, but <laughs> so when you stick this little piece of triangular foam up in the cone, so and two, two, two mil. Yeah. yeah, I use two mil. I'm in standard foam. Yeah. I could have used another size, and it's just a little platform there. Mm -hmm. I did it with dubbing. That's just simpler. And I'll do like some foam and weight ballasted flies too. I do a fly like a. Little leech I fish on Jenny Lake when you're fishing for Lakers and it's 38 degree water and they're barely moving. Where you can actually have weight on the front, you just have a little foam underneath the rabbit tail, so you can actually rock it. Mm. You know, you can barely move it. So we're gonna grab some uh, bird feathers. Uh, ring neck pheasant. Pretty bird. Pretty bird. <laughs> <laughs> heads are falling off. <laughs> Have you got any tape? <laughs> but that's kind of a cool color. I mean, you can do it with whatever you want. I mean, uh, you could use some hen hackle, you know, for tan crab. Yeah, Brahma hen's like pretty sporty. I mean, it's a nice color. We'll do the original pheasant one. I don't know if Howard gave me this pheasant. We had some pretty good pheasant food Sunday. We made pheasant larb. Nice. Mm. So great. Yeah, awesome. awesome. And we're going to need a bunch of feathers. Uh, so this has a little tinge of blue to it. It's got that blue kind of model color to it. And we're going to tie a bunch of these on. So this fluff on the butts are not going to help us anything at all. So let's just take it off. And what we can do too is. Take your thumbnail and just kind of crimp that. Set it in there. And there's one trick of tying, use your thumb. If you try to pinch that and hold it in place, it's gonna roll over, right? El snippo. It's like a real important fly tying technical term, El snippo. It's a Spanish translation of that one. Yeah. El snippo. I guess it is already. Yeah. And you can snippo. set one here and just angle it over. Yeah. <laughs> So that it's kind of over to one side, we're kind of fanning it out. And these are going to get kind of skinny in the water, so use more than you think. You know, pheasants are cheap. Did you have a good pheasant season this year? I didn't shoot any. Howard did. <laughs> so I just cheap. had these. I mean, it's super cheap for you. Yeah. 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 I got plenty of rough grass, but Guns it's so guns. funny. People go, oh, "What do you <laughs> save all your <laughs> your skins and stuff from, from your elk and stuff?" It's like, man, it's just like work. I'm trying to get an elk out of the woods before it freaking gets eaten by a bear. Yeah, or you. Yeah. <laughs> Starting to look like a little crabbish. 
So Scott, what you were referring to, because this is, these are feathers, and when one gets wet, they're going to lose gonna, profile. They're going to thin down. And there's even like when you tie in something like a deceiver, there's a minimum of three feathers to each side. Otherwise, there's no profile. They're gonna. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not. Plus, you got to have some more stuff. When you catch a bunch of fish and it gets chewed up, you still have some stuff left. You know. You got to be really hungry to eat anorexic flies. <laughs> <laughs> and just put as many as you want. But I mean, it. It looks very crabbish. And you see how that foam just kind of holds everything in place. What I do too in my, my more glue thing is I normally would actually, if I get this done, run a little goop underneath and just kind of firm it up. You know, maybe get one more feather in there. When you say goop, you're talking about shoe goo, mm -hmm. some rubberized, something with harmful solvents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you could yeah. do legs anyway. We could tie eyes on this. I mean, the eyes are going to be in the wrong spot. Uh, a lot of times I'll use bright colored legs. A lot of times I like those hot tip ones. And here's a little crab of mine. I use fox squirrel for the, uh, I'll grab it here, for the claws. And every, yeah, this is the one with this redfish goo on it still. A little stiff there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And people always assume the color at the tip of a crab claw is color. It isn't. It's called lack of color. Huh. What are they doing? They're oh, going right. around, so they tend to be lighter color there. Mm -hmm. Right. And then most crabs are tied the wrong direction. And that one's a runaway crab because crabs do this when they're moving. Mm -hmm. They're not aerodynamic. So let's go with some groovy orange legs. My fish can't count. So I'm going to tie these, uh, oh, like three or four to a side, two or three to a side. I'm going to fold this around the thread and this slip it down. And I want it slightly to the side and slightly above. And you put as many legs as you want. I mean, this is more of a, a motion thing in reality than it really is, like exact profile. That was three there. Well, while he's tying in his legs, any uh, fun, exciting stuff happening at Jay's Soulworks? Oh, there's always fun, exciting <laughs> stuff happening over yeah. there. <laughs> It's a busy uh, spring day. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. We're yeah, making we're, a bunch of messes this week. Yeah. Doing, uh, we're putting away some rye, and uh, the rye fermentations were a little more active than we bargained for. So we came in pretty much three days in a row. We tried to figure out how to solve the problem, and the whole floor of the distillery was just covered with grain and foam. And <laughs> the next morning from fermentation, just explosive fermentation which is better than no fermentation yes by a lot it is, but it, is. it means it's working <laughs> yeah which is good but that's been pretty fun and we're kicking into some whiskeys and those are a long ways away everybody asks when they're coming out so well, it's the last time yeah you couldn't even tell us that. yeah, yeah. Well, we can't we're tell you anymore that cat's out of the bag now yeah. <laughs> so, is it going to be brown yeah. well it's gonna be yeah yeah Seems to be brown. <laughs> working towards that, which is cool. But it's it's really fun. It's it's cool to explore, you know, new creative stuff. And and you know, we've taken our time to learn our process very well, so that when we're getting into these whiskeys, we're not going in at it too early and and assuming too much, which we don't like to do. So um, well, yeah, it's been coming out good. I mean, you yeah. I mean, that's, thieves that's, and barrels recently. That's you want to talk about that? The way you guys have been approaching the whole system. Is Slow and low is yeah. the tempo, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We started with the vodka, then slowly came out with the gin, and we have the barrel aged gin, and now we're uh, into the exciting mm -hmm. brown waters of rye, wheat, bourbon, things like that, and uh, just experimenting too. At the same time, you know, mm -hmm. trying different yeast strains, and uh, yeah, just making making cool stuff because you know, a tiny little distillery, with, you know, gives us the flexibility of being able to. Kind of bounce around, and try cool little well, things. You have you know. your own personal taste test. That's right? true. Yes. Yeah, we've got the pro right here. <laughs> right you know, Howard's, you Howard's, <laughs> Howard's ready to, to taste. You, you know. Actually, <laughs> 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 do you have these different casks, the different types of? Uh, 
we we there's we don't use dif different casks, but we use uh, different. There's different schools of thought for different levels of char inside the barrels. Char meaning you know yeah. how burnt the barrels yeah. are. So, you know, a heavy char yields this style of flavor. A really light char yields these more delicate notes. Things like that. So. You know, that's another thing we play with is, you know, it's not just the grain, it's not just the yeast, but it's it's the barrels, like you say, and, you know, how to manipulate between, how to choose between what char, but also what manufacturer, too. Manufacturers use wood from different forests. Right. Different forests mm -hmm. offer different dirt and different slope angles and different drainage and different climate, you know. Now, now how do you acquire these barrels? Yeah, mm -hmm. it is, and and there's a lot of people struggling to get um, uh, barrels from cooperages, and we were lucky enough years ago to get connected with a really cool cooperage out in California that's primarily known for their wine barrels, sure. and they're actually quite coveted, and so uh, they spun off a small um, little sort of, I don't know, a smaller company off of the, the larger one, and started doing 53 gallon barrels. Wine barrels tend to be 59. Mm -hmm. And so they started doing spirit barrels and we just happened to be at the right place at the right time at a convention and met some great people who um, we connected with and they were like, we can get you barrels. And they are beautiful. They're all Missouri oak that come into uh, California and then they yard age the staves for 12 to 24 months. And then um, all actually wood fired um, charring, which um, some people use propane um, and uh, and then our heads on these barrels are all toasted. So we're getting charring in the barrels tends to um, the deeper the char, the more of that kind of rich caramely notes. The lighter the char, the more you move towards vanillas and and those kind of uh, flavor profiles. So to have a little bit of the combination of both, you get a little bit those a little bit of the caramels, a little bit of that vanilla. Um, it kind of opens up a little bit more of a dynamic flavor and something that's not quite as mono-dimensional as you might get from just a straight shot, yeah. which is fun. Very so. cool. Yeah. 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 It'll be fun. Yeah. It's, it's, cool. it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of art to it. A lot yeah. of art and a lot of fingers crossed, too. <laughs> <laughs> there is some yeah. risk Jackson. involved. Yeah. 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 It sounds like yeah. Scott has yeah. his flies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a fingers lot to crossed. correlate between distilling and fly tying, and not yeah. just the drinking part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, a lot of stuff takes a lot of patience and, and time and, and and practice, you know, and it's kind of what we're in, in the middle well, of. Well, in the store, and people ask me, is this made in Jackson's? The only thing made in Jackson's bad decisions, babies, and cocktails. <laughs> 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 All right, where do we end up on that crab? So we got a little leggy crab. Do you want eyeballs? I think we should have eyeballs. Oh, yeah. We had some bonus yeah, yeah, eyeballs, eyeballs there. Yeah. What do you got there? So I think I'll tie these on the bottom and just let them extend back. Will be a good way to do these. That'll put the eyeballs in the right spot. And these are the ones I just mash the bead off. Here again, that thumb down. If you're tying print snaps, everybody has trouble with print snaps, right? Getting those biots set. If you just smash them down with your thumb. And then a lot of fly tying just being cruel to inanimate objects. I mean, like, this was a dinosaur a really long time ago, or a coral reef or something. It just doesn't really care. It doesn't have a whole lot of feelings, you know. I mean, you look at it, I mean, so much fly down, it's just tweaking stuff, you know, like the comb that won't work for my hair, but it works for a fly, you know. I love that sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Clink, clink, clink. <laughs> That's a good sound, That's too. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and we'll yeah. do a little uh, hand whip Both. finish. <laughs> We can run a little super goo up the bottom here, but I mean, pretty uh, in scientific terms, groovalicious crap. I mean, yeah. that I mean, that awesome. looks like the that real deal. So great. <laughs> I mean, and it's so simple. Yeah. yeah. I mean, literally, if we weren't, wow. you know, chewing the fat here and doing these, these are like five minute flies. I mean, they're so really, really simple. Awesome. And that deal is it needs to act like the real thing, not look perfect, but. That's pretty crabbish. Mm -hmm. You know, and just with the amount of feathers out there, you could do, I mean, like 
Bald eagle feathers work really, really well. Uh, <laughs> polar bear dubbing. Polar bear, oh yeah, polar bear yeah, dubbing, you know. Spotted owls. You yeah. Know, yeah. Florican bustard on top, you know, yeah. a little jungle cock. But no, that's a simple, nice little crab. Couple, if you're going on a saltwater trip, this also makes a nice crawdad. Mm, oh, Crawdaddy yeah. daddy. Mm -hmm. Or lobster, or it's just a crustacean. <laughs> But there you go. Very cool. What's your name for the crab? Let's call it the feather crab. and come a better name. <laughs> Looking for two names tonight. Yeah. yeah. But it's got the nice thing there. I mean, yeah, you can put eyes on if you want. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, where you're going with a bunch of turtle grass and whatever. I mean, you have the advantage of the bend back hook, uh, but where you can lightly uh, weight it. So it doesn't get into that turtle grass. So oh, you can do this unweighted. Yeah. I mean, and like, yeah. And one of the most forgotten things on flats flies is sometimes it's more important to have more weights than more patterns. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason you fish mm -hmm. small bonefish flies is not because a bonefish or a redfish won't eat a fly this big in shallow water. You just can't drop it on them without scaring the hell out of them. Yeah. You know, so smaller flies are what you do. But yeah, a couple fun little flies there. Is anyone going down south this spring break? Not this year. I'm going to Hawaii too, actually. Not this year. Not me. Awesome. Yeah. You are going? I am, yeah, but that, I think just for a surfing and beach time. Not as, I've never actually gone fishing in Hawaii. So. It's okay. kind of yeah. tough fishing. I mean, unfortunately, it's a place where there's not a lot of conservation mm. and a lot of that. Don't know there's trout in Hawaii? We have a TU chapter there. I no, there's actually you, on Kauai, no, there's wild. trout. Yeah. 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 Do that, you know. We need a, we need a Kauai branch Retreat. of Trout Unlimited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ready to open I'm it. dead serious. Yeah. No. They're awesome catch, volunteers. Catch, catch one little trout and go uh, catch peacock bass out of the Sherbet Cane Reservoirs. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Catch stuff you can't catch. Up. There yeah. Oh, God, there's there's the biggest freaking turkeys in the world on Big Island. Really? Oh, God, they're like... I swear to God, they're like 40 pounds. What kind of <laughs> are they? I mean, I'm not sure if they're Miriams or whatever, but everything you put there grows, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's like Franklin grouse everywhere, too, in these cool. desert spots, you know. Just, I guess it's kind of tricky to get a hunting thing. You have to like check your gun in and stuff and have, you know, connections. But there's like Molokai is like the Wyoming of Hawaii, man. Those guys are just like, every little store is like, there's ammo there, like shooting axis deer. <laughs> And there's wow. pigs. I mean, there's just everything they dropped there just took off. I mean, the Forest Service, we camped out in uh, Haleakala on, you know, on Maui once, you know, got a permit. Got there's pheasants all over the place, but the Park Service just promotes the boundary and shoots the pigs and goats. Wow. People get in there and with those monument yeah. plants that bloom every, what, thousand years or something mm. crazy. I mean, if you get one of those get eaten, there's like 20 of them in the world. I wow. mean, so that's their, you know. Human planning gone bad. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of those bend back hooks. If you want to see like a pre made bend back hook from Umqua, I think they're made by VMC. Mm -hmm. VMC's still around. Yeah, but these are VMC made in Singapore, Indonesia. I mean, like we just gone offshore on their factories. They're not in France anymore. I mean, except the factory, or the offices. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for the flies, Scott. Uh, we cool. still need some names, so you guys hit us up in the comments, uh, send us a message, and we'll send you the fly. Um, thank you, ladies, for coming and for all the awesome info. Um, we'll be sure to share all of that and the event on March 8th. If you guys live here locally in town, um, definitely tune in on that. And thank you, men, for the cocktails. <laughs> yep. Absolutely delicious, no getting us in the spring break mood. Yeah. Uh, it was hit yeah. 50 today, so we are certainly there. <laughs> um, give us a like, give us a follow, so you guys can get notifications when we do some more live stuff. We've got a couple more shows left this spring. Um, and then it's and then it's fishing season for real. All right. Then I'll get out there because it's warm enough, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, everyone have a good night. Thanks again, and we'll see you guys soon. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Austin Latako. <laughs>